So for everybody, you guys, uh, for those of you that haven't been uh, in the series, this is our pediatric stroke um, educational series. We've been running these uh, events um, over the last uh, almost three years now, in, initially in person uh, here in Boston. And then when COVID uh, uh, started, we turned it into webinars and that's when a lot of more access occurred to people that are not only in the Boston, New England area. So as you guys know, uh, these series are um, driven by the families, the patients and the parents affected. They have kids that have suffered a stroke and it, from the realization that it really is very limited what we are able to offer from the clinical side uh, when the families have to go out in the real world and find the resources and, and kind of like transcurs the journey of recovering and also developing after brain injury. So we've been having and touching on different subjects and one of our latest uh, webinars was uh, Constraining Youth Movement Therapy. Uh, and uh, Christina Cosa was very generous in offering her uh, kind of over, overview and understanding of what this therapy is intended to do and how to uh, leverage the potentials of this therapy apply at different times in development. Uh, we know a lot more in early development, but we also see some benefits and in particular cases for children that are older. So from the post survey and from the meetings of our parent advisory board, it became very clear that people really wanted to have more time for questions. So, <laughs> so we ask again, uh, this is all volunteer work, as you guys know, uh, if they will be available and, and is, is a group of our occupational therapists here today are gonna be opening the forum basically for questions that pertain to the doubts and the, the things that you would like to learn and know and how to adapt this conceptual idea of constraint in youth movement therapy and by manual kind of uh, association. So um, before I pass it on to um, the introduction of the of our, I'm not gonna call it our, our speakers, but we're gonna call it our, our helpers, our therapists. Um, so I wanna ask everybody if you guys can rename yourself uh, in that little window that you have. There are three dots at the top if you hover over your own view. And in those three dots, you can see a rename. And what we like to do to generate a community and you guys can also use the chat to communicate to each other. We don't limit that communication and you can put the questions in the chat if you, if someone else is speaking and something comes up to mind so we can moderate the questions and there is no people overlapping. But when you rename, if you could say your name, the age of your child or if you are the one affected with a stroke and what, from what part of the United States or the, or the world are you coming from? Uh, so we also, uh, are today um, in this month in the Stroke Awareness Month. And that's why we are doing a lot of webinars this month. We wanted to really uh, do an extra effort to uh, outreach and, and provide these resources that we are creating. So uh, almost every Friday, there is gonna be an activity uh, which has had uh, movement therapy with Feldon Kreis, with Mara and Maddie last Friday. The recording is gonna be soon uploaded to the YouTube channel. Uh, this is a Q&A follow-up of the Constraining Use Movement Therapy. And next Friday, we're going to talk about behavioral issues and social competence uh, with Alicia, one of Alice, one of our um, specialists here in the um, Aspire program, uh, which is part of the Lurie Center at MGH. So with that, I'm gonna let Christina introduce yourself again. <laughs> I know we could, we know you uh, and and your team. So so people then can just start the questions. And guys, feel free to start putting questions in the chat. Um, thank you for having me again, Patty and Mara. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm Christina Casa. I'm one of the pediatric occupational therapists here at MGH. My colleague Suzanne will be here very soon, um, so she'll be also be available for questions and another perspective. Um, we also have Mary Rebecca Trucks, who's part of the um, I Acquire study, um, which I'm sure we've mentioned before, um, but she's also here to answer any questions about um, enrollment or, you know, what it looks like. Um, I'm also part of that study, so I'm happy to answer any of those questions as well. 
Um, just as just to kind of start off those kind of questions and what you guys are curious about, going back to the last uh, presentation that we did is a lot of the questions were, okay, great, now how do I do this at home, right? What does this look, look like for me at home? How do I get this started? Or, um, you know, where should I begin? How often should I be doing it? Um, so I'm, I'm, my plan today is just to help guide you through any of those kind of general questions um, and see if I can help give you a few more tips and tricks um, to help you uh, implement this and integrate it into your routines and how to support your children, okay? Um, the most typical questions that I found that when I went through the last recording was that it was, how do I integrate? And then when should I start um, by manual? How do I switch over to constraint for by manual? So if any of those questions kind of come, are kind of related to what you're thinking, um, please feel free to unmute. Um, if not, I kind of have like a little general slide that we can go through to help organize it if that would be more helpful. So we have one uh, question from Lori already. Lori, do you okay. wanna ask your question out loud? Hi, sure. Hi. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'll put my video on too. Um, <laughs> hi, Lori. <laughs> hi. I just had a question um, and I haven't watched the last session yet, the last CIMT session, so I apologize. Um, but my daughter is 13. Uh, she mm -hmm. had a stroke at the age of eight. Um, and, you know, we always talk about doing constraint induced movement therapy. And my question with doing it with her is she really has very limited use of her affected arm. Mm -hmm. And so doing something like CIMT and she has to have a bathroom, which usually she does very independently, mm -hmm. type of thing work, um, while you're doing CIMT. Like, I'm not quite sure like how that all works. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's fantastic that she's, that you guys have figured out that routine and that she's developed that um, independence in that everyday activity. And so that's a great question to know how, if you were to do this intensity, how that might start to potentially inhibit the things that she's already independent in. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, you did, yep. Yes, okay. Um, you know, I think then it becomes about timing, right? I think, you know, when we're thinking constraint, there's all about the intensity for, for hours, right? We're doing it two or three hours a day or anything like that. Um, and I think about, you know, what are your goals that you're going to do it with within the context of the constraint, right? So if right now you've, you know, you've reported that very limited use. So all of that range of motion to be able to complete some of that toileting routine might not be there yet. So I think your goal when you're going to do constraint is to start working on that range of motion to participate in that, in those activities, right? So then maybe we're doing a little, we're doing some reaching or we're just reaching towards a target. Maybe we're just being able to be able to work on either opening or closing or sustaining to be able to hold the toilet paper or anything like that outside of the bathroom. Um, and hopefully time it at a time where that's, she doesn't need to use it because I, I wouldn't want at the moment, if you're gonna start it, I wouldn't want that to be a discouragement. Right. So okay. I would think about, like I would really break down the activity analysis. And I think that was kind of my thought process too for today is like, what are the steps that she needs to do that task? Um, and then kind of meet her at her level. Okay. So maybe for you as in the moment, as you, kind of start it you might not be doing it for four hours of a day you may you might be just starting small so you can work on some of those range of motion skills to complete that task okay that makes sense okay have you done constraint before no we have not <laughs> okay We've okay thought about it and we just haven't done it and I think it's something we really at some point want to try yeah yeah I mean I think if if anything, a great start would just be creating that awareness, you know, um, just to be, just create some awareness, some interest, some acknowledgement of how to incorporate 
using that affected side. All right. One other thing I would offer for an older child is just to consider a removable cast. So yeah. mm -hmm. oh. if she's independent with toileting, mm -hmm. you could also get her to engage with when it's on and when it's off, you know, so you build a schedule collaboratively and then she can also say, okay, it's time to go to the bathroom. I'm going to take mm -hmm. the cast off. As mm -hmm. a 13 year old, yeah. she might yeah. want that autonomy. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, Haley, you have an eight month old. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, we recently had a CIM CIMT evaluation and they offer intensives. And I was curious about the age for doing more of a permanent cast. I realize it's removable, but the recommendation is to keep it on always during that intensive. And my concern is with what she's working on with her gross motor development, that cast hindering those things like weight bearing through the arm to work into four point crawling and sitting, you know, prop sitting and those kind of things. So we're going to do CAMT, just not with a cast right now and our hospital allows that, but I, I'm just curious at what developmental stage or maybe even age doing that permanent cast would be the most beneficial. That's a great question and that's great things to kind of keep in mind. You're right, that cast would start to um, inhibit and you know the quality of some of those other developmental milestones that um, your daughter is just kind of naturally going to be working on. Um, Mary, I might ask for your assistance in answering that question um, because I know that we kind of look at um, when we're assessing during the study is we're looking at how they're doing all of those gross motor milestones, right? Reaching out of sitting, transitioning out of sitting, getting into four point um, and how that might be working when the kids are wearing the cast. Sure. So my role with the iAquire study is specifically with treatment and treatment, treatment implementation and monitoring therapists. And I would encourage you, if you're at all interested, to consider signing up. And so to take it to the point of the gross motor skill development, it is possible the therapists are trained to work with the little ones on weight bearing through their arm and also working on crawling, pushing to sit through their involved arm and hand. The cast, you know what, if you can give me just five seconds and let me, I have actually have a cast in my house. So give me just, just a second. Um, and what I will do is show you. So the position of the cast is in a really functional position that goes on the child's arm and it keeps their elbow bent at 90 degrees and it goes just below their shoulder. And so it puts them in a place where they can work on crawling. And the therapist, if we, if I had a child come in for treatment and they were not able to crawl, that would definitely be a goal of mine. Now I might not start with that initially. What I might do initially is get them to work on any kind of weight bearing through their involved arm and hand, even if that's in a sitting position and the way I position a toy, I'm getting them to reach lower. So they get weight going through their arm and hand, but it is certainly, I actually, we had a kiddo last month that I watched, it was really exciting through the, through the video, develop the ability to crawl over the month. They had started, she was army crawling. And then over the course of the month through the week to week video, I could see the therapists working. And typically what they do because we aim for it to be positive is they'll put something that's really motivating fairly close to the child and say, oh, okay, let's go get, you know, they're motivated by Elmo. Let's go get Elmo. We're going to get Elmo. And there, there's crying, there's tears, right? That's part of it. But they're successful in doing that. And then they learn wow, I can crawl and I can use my crawling to go get my favorite toy or to come to you as mom. So I guess the, the, short, the, the short answer to that is yes, that is something that we could work on over the course of the month. Okay. And just real quick, the, you know, some of the leader, the studies leading up to I Acquire Now did look at what the development was after from the good arm and the one that was casted and they really showed no detriment and no kind of regression in, their, in what they were doing with their good arm once that cast came off. So they're continuing to learn, you know, the expectation is there really isn't a lot of side, negative side effects. 
um, from using that cast on a regular basis and, and they catch right back up once it comes off. Okay. Yeah, so I also fair. just want to chime in from a parent perspective. When my daughter, who's now almost 12, when she was 12 months old, so just turning one, she was starting to walk. So she was a very new walker when I first started doing constraint therapy. And I didn't, I wanted her to be able to transition from crawling to walking back and forth and also to be able to brace herself with both arms when she fell, when she was walking. So I opted for a, a below the elbow splint. This was the um, neoprene splint that has a hard palmer surface. So she couldn't grasp anything with that affected, I mean, with the unaffected hand. Yeah. Um, and that, I actually felt like there was a question that came up before we, um, which I'm sure we'll get into about integration in life and by manual use. So for, for us, having use of the elbow meant that she was using both hands in more activities, even while she wasn't using the hand on the, um, the stronger or the unaffected side. So, that's, that's outside of a clinical trial, just like me trying to maximize the integration of the skills into life. So. Yeah, that's really helpful. That's really, it's like more of the bent at 90 degrees and her not being able to weight bear with either arm right now that I would be concerned about doing a permanent cast. So that, that makes a lot of sense. So I appreciate that. Okay, so Karen's question Karen, um, why don't you ask it? And then Jordan and Leslie also want to chime in around that theme. Hi. Um, so we, um, my son, his name's Chappie. He'll be three in August. And we've been pretty, I guess his team has been pretty aggressive on constraints. So um, this is, he's actually doing his sixth casting right now. Um, and I guess my question was, which, you know, I, I've never, is that if there's a time where it kind of levels off and you do a different intervention or is this like a therapy that's kind of used throughout their lives? I think, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 most definitely. You're like, how, how often are we going to have to keep up with this routine? Yeah. And I think in addition to, if you don't mind me asking another, one other addition is like, you know, he'll be going into preschool next year. So do people, send their kids into preschool, if you know, with the cast on, you know, he'll be on an IEP, but is that something that is done or do you take a break from as frequent? That's my question. <laughs> That's, those, well. are, those, <laughs> those are great questions. And yeah, you're like, how often are we going to continue to do this? And I think the way I kind of look at it is that as your kid develops new skills and new opportunities are going to come up. And it might be the thing where it's like, we're going to do it as like a boost. And each time we do it, we go in with a new foundation of skills. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's three now. So he's working on his building and his coloring, um, maybe a little bit of dressing. And, you know, in a, in a couple of years, he's going to be doing a little bit more coloring and a little bit more writing and a little bit more dressing um, with like fasteners and things like that. So yeah. Um, just kind of as we kind of go through these little bursts of developmental um, gains that it might be something that we take as to give us a little bit, a new foundation to uh, increase our independence. So it's hard, to, it's hard to tell like how often or how, how long. Um, I kind of view it as um, just kind of uh, an Let's upkeep. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, and no, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. So, um, so I, again, I'm going to offer my parent perspective. So I um, didn't do intensive like 24 seven. I did it mm -hmm. on vacation and weekends when I was with my child, but my child was in daycare. So I found a way that it was something we did as part of our routine for like three hours a day from age 12 months to two and a half years. So there was always breakfast eaten with the right hand mm -hmm. and some kind of sensory play that I taught the daycare providers to do 
first thing in the morning for all the children so that my child wasn't singled out. It was something fun with shaving cream or a bin, a sensory bin, something, water play, uh, morning snack, again, with something I would send that was easy to work on that pincer grasp. And then when it was time to go to outside recess, then they took the splint off and she went out to play with both hands. Um, and then at two and a half, she could take the Velcro off with her affected hand. And I felt like she had earned the right to say no. And we took a break until she was six or seven years old and found the splint in her room and started to say, can, can I do this? I wanna work on righty again. So it was really driven by the child. Um, if you can uh, be that patient. So that's that's another perspective. But I actually am also interested in Mary Rebecca's perspective. And then I know that Jordan is struggling with this um, sort of how much to do this versus other things. I'll jump in briefly and just say that over the years, I've seen children, sometimes I see them once and I never see them again. Sometimes I see them every four years. And then I see a handful that I've seen on a yearly basis. And it does change depending on their age. I feel like it's, you know, it's easier to do the intensives when they're younger back to back because they don't really realize what's going on so much, right? They kind of shift away from the cast and they're more interested if the therapist is really engaging in whatever the activity is. And what we've seen through the research that we've collected is that those skills are maintained. They might not use those skills as frequently as they do with their stronger arm and hand, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but the skills are maintained and so they, they come back. And what we see sometimes is that we put the cast on we were talking about this just before it started. They, we put the cast on and you see the skills increase automatically. But then when you take the cast off and you're asking them to split their attention between both hands, I think that's when it becomes difficult. And so clinically, this is we're able to say, okay, well, this child has had several rounds of constraint with us. And we feel like maybe, yes, they would benefit from a portion of their time being with constraint but then also a significant portion of their time being bilateral. Because at the end of the day, what we're wanting to teach these children is that your hand is useful and you can use your hand and it might be different and that's okay, but you can still use two hands throughout. So I think, I mean, going along with what Christina and Mara were saying, I think that as children age, their needs change and we need to adjust within reason as, they, as their needs change. No, that makes him a lot of mess. Do you mind if I ask you one? I know there's another one quick, quick question. That's fine. Go ahead. It, it's fine. So it has to, and I might not be understanding, but you know, like our neurologist is explaining, you know, that the castings really kind of, you know, their brains are so plastic. So, you know, with the bilateral, you know, he gets that tone back, but he can control that tone more and more with the cat. Like constraint has been amazing for him. Um, <laughs> um, it, it, with, you know, working by, you know, but is there an age, I guess, where the, the brain isn't as plastic, so it stops kind of controlling that, helping him control that tone? Is, I, I might also just not understand it all that. Does that make sense? Like, is that where it doesn't have a, such an impact on like creating those neural pathways or, um, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, so I think it makes sense. Um, I think there's there's brain plasticity throughout the lifespan. Um, it's you know it's maximum in the first three years, but it it's available at all ages. And what we see when when kids and adults put casts on their dominant arm is that the tone quiets, whatever tone is there in the affected side quiets down. Um, I don't know if Brian, do you wanna to speak to that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good point, right? CIMT was something that was originally, was often done after stroke in adults. So it's definitely something I can 
value, I think, through the lifetime of going through. I agree. I think, you know, when we when we take out some of this overflow energy and, and we're not working for other aspects, you can see the overall tone decrease. Um, so using that cast may be helpful if it's, you know, if they're able to focus a little bit better. Um, I think it, I, it's hard to say 100% specifically without kind of knowing the tone and, and the picture, but um, I don't know if I have a, a hard cutoff date on when I would say it's not something that would be helpful tone, you know, especially in the younger kids, right? Our, our muscles and bones, our bones grow faster than our muscles and tendons. So we're always kind of fighting this and chasing down their growth. Um, so it's also something that may be sort of fluctuant as you're going through this and, and finding the right times when they're maybe a little bit more steady might be helpful, but I, I think it's sort of a, a you know, do what you can and, and see how it goes. Um, Jordan, do you want to um, jump in about this question of sure. when um, to continue all, or stop? Here's my son with Mary Rebecca on his last day. He's very happy. Um, so yeah, I have this question and I know um, it's going to strike as like, please predict the future for me. Give me the crystal ball. But I just really want to see if there's any pattern. Um, and maybe I'm kind of tricking you into doing that, but like there's any pattern because like my experience um, with our, our son is we did the um, constraint intensive at age two, two and a half, three, four, then five. Um, and it was really effective each time. But if I, and I perpetually live in the shadow of coulda, woulda, shoulda, I'm like working on that for myself, but if I could do it all over again, I might back off a little bit in that like four or five and start getting him more in like group activities. Because what we have found and especially exacerbated with the pandemic is that like as a whole child, other things come. And Mary Becca knows this too, because my son is very spirited and definitely challenged her, but you know, they're, they're bonded like that. He mentions her all the time. He's like, I can do this new thing with Brady show Mary Rebecca <laughs> and we'll have to send her a video but anyway but like I just wonder like do you see any pattern over like you know I would try to jam in as much constraint in the infant years like and then like maybe back off a little bit to like a once a year rhythm or once every two year or then maybe like back off completely and do like a camp format where you may not gain as much individually because it's not so targeted but you might gain in terms of like the spirit with, you know, camaraderie with other kids from ages like say four to six or seven where they're not a girl, but not yet a woman spirit wise. And then like at age seven or eight, go back to like Mara described with her daughter, like the self-moded constraint. That's like, actually, I really want to be able to cut my food like by myself, like not in front of my friends. I really want to like, you know, tie my hair, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll like want to opt in again, but with their own set of goals. So I'm really struggling with that, like right now of what the right balance between like effectiveness and like spirit crushing. So, cause I like heavily air on the side of spirit crushing, unchecked, sorry. Um, well, I think, um, I think it's really great that you recognize like what can we do for him as a whole child like just as him as a little guy and what's like his extra extracurricular activity doesn't have to be constraint right it's like you found all these other things for him to do and he's got this new foundation of skills each time that you go and so I think the whole goal is to naturally use that affected side more often so I think right now you're just like we're gonna play we're gonna go be with our friends and we're gonna see what happens and then maybe as you're watching him, then maybe you're thinking of like some other um, activities at home or exercises that you could do at home, right? If he's like going to like play basketball or anything like that, and that one hand isn't reaching up as much as we'd like it to, right? Then maybe like, okay, let's do that a little bit on the weekends, right? That's what I, I wanna target that. I wanna say like, let's get working our hands to be able to get that ball into the hoop, right? So you're having a more specific child motivated activity and then that might tie in between the we don't want to spirit crush we want to use this as a way to facilitate this is our tool this is our tool in our back pocket that's going to help us get to that end goal 
And even, I mean, I say it facetiously because every therapist we've had has not been spirit crushing. I yeah, say that. no, no, I, I know. I, I spirit <laughs> clarify, no. They actually make it really fun. But even when I'm considering the summer, I'm like, you know, even if it's fun, right? It's still like pulling him back into, this is what we're working on. This is like hard for you. This is an area that like, you just can't help but think like surround sound, there's something wrong with me. It's patientizing, like the experience. Mm -hmm. And then I think, what am I really trying to gain here this summer? Like, is it like, yeah, it would be great if he could unbuckle his his seatbelt. It would be great if he's the only person in class when having to ask for help opening up like a pirate booty you know Mm -hmm. like it would be great but like at what expense of patientizing or maybe should I just have him do like a activity you know yeah I mean I think those are great like observations you're like I don't want him to always feel like we're always fixing something or always working on something um you know sometimes I think that's why it's helpful to have that this is the one thing I really want to accomplish just like anything right you know you have anyone is like, I'm playing baseball and I really want to work on my swing. I've been striking out regardless. Right. So I'm going to go to the batting cages. I'm going to do a little bit more, um, just to get to the end goal. Um, so do you guys see, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go, you go. Do you guys see like, as kids grow up, did they, what intervals do they, is it like every six months is best and every year, then every two years, then every three years. Is there like a standard deviation norm of like, this is kind of the trajectory? Um, If anyone else has the answer to that, um, please feel free to jump in. That I don't think has been plotted yet. I, Jordan, I think it's, um, you know, you, you do what works for your child and for your family and sort of what's the most pressing need, right? So is there a skill le- is there a refined skill level needed with the affected side hand to achieve some goal in daily life or for the child or um, like what's the motivation like what are the goals i i, I actually want to shift to agnieszka's um, questions because i think they're relevant and around the same age and will will continue to be in the in the same soup can you ask about this case, Agnieszka, and I know that um, Jordan's son also had Botox, so that can also be in the conversation. Oh, sure, yeah, so my son just had Botox for the third time or fourth, maybe, last week. Um, I think they did too much, because actually right now he like cannot bend, he cannot grasp anything with lefty, so (laughs) I'm glad it's um, not permanent, but anyway, so this is like the special window where we're supposed to do super duper therapy and do lots of things where he's actually can stretch and, um, and I've been really good when he was younger and had lots of tons of activities and Pinterest and this and balls and you name it, I had it, but you know, he's almost six and he's like not into it at all anymore. And I try to make him sit down every morning and I have a big box of different things that we used to do little, little games and I put his right arm in a, in a mitt, I have an oven mitt that I kind of wrap around his arm and we try to do it every morning. And sometimes it's five minutes, I try to make it 30, but, um, but I, I have a hard time finding resources. Now we do have therapists, but she has kind of sometimes good ideas, sometimes not, but I'd love to find an online resource somewhere where for kids like school age kids. And I know it's, it's much easier to put a mitt on a three-year-old and tell him what to do than a six, seven-year-old and tell him what to do. So. During this two months, I don't know if you have any suggestions or online sources where I can, for these kind of medium-sized kids. Um, I know that would be great. Like he needs his own like little, like a podcast or he needs like a little, like some blog that he can like look at and maybe like he can take a look at some pictures and see what he wants to do. Uh, we should start. With, we should um, start sorry, that. Christina. No, sometimes, you jump in. Sometimes with um, older kids who have had some Botox, so obviously, you know, you want him to have a little bit more movement, but sometimes that's when more active um, outdoor or athletic activities can come, like riding a scooter or a bike, because that encourages ex- extension. Um, and so that can really stretch it, stretch them out. And then after you can follow up with a more, 
maybe something um, that they want to do outside, but maybe it's or that you're working on. Again, something really specific that they've said that they wish that they could do better. But sometimes I've found after Botox to do some larger gross motor movements like bikes or scooters, or if they like doing things on the grass, um, those things can really get some stretched out and then follow up with more of a functional task. That again, that I wholeheartedly agree that hopefully they're starting to say, this is what I wish I could do, or I love to do this, or I wanna do this with my friends and put those activities and try and follow up with something like that. So you're, you're thinking more kind of two-handed things for gross things, mm -hmm. not so yes. much sitting down at a table and just do it with Lefty. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a really fun age and this is a fun time of year to start doing that. Um, I guess for me, I'm also thinking like after the Botox, it's a really good time to get some of the more extensor um, movements in to start out in some sort of those heavier activities, um, just as almost a warm up, warming up the body, stretching out um, from the tone, and then maybe after doing those activities, following up with something a little bit finer. So maybe outside, but doing something at a table, some coloring or painting or, if they're, you know, again, if he likes cooking or, you know, whatever his interest is, but maybe starting out with something that's a little bit more gross motor into extension, warming up um, is something that um, I've seen kind of work, work nicely with the kids who have more of the tone and then, and then have the Botox and to, um, to, get that, to get that initially, I think is a nice combination. So that would be just a, a thought. Great, thank you. Yeah, Suzanne, I, I agree. I think that's a great strategy, particularly if the flexors maybe are having a little bit of trouble after the Botox, if we if we hit them a little bit too hard. You know, the other thing to, to look at and make sure is um, make sure his wrist is staying neutral when he's trying to do stuff. If he's coming down like this, if there's a little bit of weakness, even a little bit of flexion in that wrist is gonna make it even harder for him to use those finger flexors. Um, so, you know, I don't know if he has a brace or something like that, but, you know, those really subtle ones that are able to keep them in a good neutral position. We'll just maximize it at maybe a time where using a scooter or something like that, where it's not really the, the small motions if he's, if he's lost some of that strength with the Botox, but it's more of those big proximal stuff that you can work on right now. And I, I would also think about sporting equipment so a lacrosse stick or a hockey stick, it, you know, even for the, the driveway or the backyard, uh, balls of different shapes and sizes, bats. So just like let him play and explore with, with sports and all that like bats and sticks are all gonna be by manual and, and let him pick which hand's the top hand, which hand's the bottom hand and try it both ways and, you know, get a, some kind of target that that's not going to break or hurt anything, but <laughs> the kids that age like to throw stuff. So, and then the other thought I had is I know Christina has worked at camps in the past and there's, there's definitely one family that I know that sets up like a whole theme of fun. So themes, um, when my child was that age, there was a Lego theme, there was an Olympic theme, there was a camping theme. So if you pick a theme, then you can find activities that fit in with that theme. It's obviously easier if it's a camp and there's uh, OTs and uh, organizers figuring it out. But even with those three themes I named, you might be able to brainstorm activities and then you know have some kind of recognition of, of milestones within the, the week. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm just gonna hop in for a second. Um, so I have a thir now 13 year old right-handed Hemi. She had a stroke when she was eight. So I think our experience maybe is a little different. Um, we do do the Botox and we did, as, as someone else was talking about, just really abused her for the first three years uh, with therapy and everything. On, on the Botox, two things that we found are really great, swimming. 
um, really the gross motor um, and it's just fun, but they really, with the Botox being able to move their arm more, we've even gotten our daughter to try doing a little bit of crawl um, when she's got sort of a little bit less tone. Um, they also make these ball games where it's like a little trampoline that you hold and you hit them back and forth. And what you get there is extension from both arms. You get bilateral, you get the need to grip the side of the, the toy um, and it's fun. So it sort of hits a lot of the things um, I think that we all try and work on with the, with the bilateral. And it is that, you know, an up and down motion, they're trying to bring it to sort of hit the ball back to you. Um, so it can be frustrating or it can be, you can probably find them on Amazon. I don't try to remember what it's called now, but. Well, what would be like keywords, like trampoline ball? Yeah, it's, um, I don't know, my wife's on, maybe she, she if she's listening, maybe she remembers. Um, yeah, something like that. It's a, it's like a it's like a bounce ball game. I don't know what. I could probably run in the garage and see the one we have. <laughs> we have um, this other one that that opens and closes, and it's I don't know if there's Velcro. I think looking for like paddle like games that are almost like beach games that you're tossing a ball back and forth, and different mechanisms for catching. Yeah. Yeah, we have one that Velcros onto the hand also. And then she puts it on her right side and then um, she has to, you have to pull the ball off of it, but she does that with her left and throws it. So she gets a lot of different work. Um, just real real quick, like we, we, after her stroke, we just, she was in, she was in hospital for a while. We just started setting up appointments for her and Average week, 12, 17 therapy appointments between speech, PT, OT. Um, and we just said, we're gonna push her as hard as we can until she just starts to revolt. Cause we knew that would happen at some point. And that happened and she's 13 now. And she did not want any adaptive tools in the kitchen, very resistant. And now we're finding she wants to cook on her own. She's very much, the cutting boards, the things that she's finding the things she wants to work on, both with trying to use her right hand, um, finding ways to do things one-handed, using adaptive tools. She wanted nothing to do with therapy for a while. We kind of tried to give her some freedom, some things we couldn't, reading and speech were just had to happen to keep her as best we could at grade level. But she's coming back around now. She'll come downstairs, look, I did my hair. Um, I did, those things are, are naturally now, she's 13 years old, wants to go out and do things with her friends. And we're finding definitely some more acceptance of working on certain things. But as someone said before, it's, it's her goals now, not our goals. Um, but it, it does come around and all their goals also tend to line up with our goals ultimately of self-sufficiency, gaining as much movement in the hemi side as possible. Um, so, so it does come around again, if you're feeling that frustration, we, we consolidated appointments, switched things to once a week, um, really gave her a chance to make friends and do other things. And now we're finding a little bit more of a mix again, um, as there's things that she really wants in her life. So hopefully that's helpful. Thanks. We have uh, about 10 more minutes. We're gonna keep this one to a tight hour. So I'm just curious if there are other questions. I don't have other questions in the chat, but are there other questions you can just unmute and ask? And if not, we um, we we could end early or we could- um, I just have one quick question. Um, I'm curious, I guess it's along the lines of kind of what we've been talking about. I'm mom to Roman, who's almost seven, and he um, participated in a lot of a lot of years of constraint, and we had great results. And you know, he's turning seven next month, and we're just in you know sort of a float about life phase. And but there are so many things for him that are super challenging that we've kind of just danced around. You know, like zipping when zips are you know more challenging. We don't tie shoes, like opening packages, cutting. Um, squeezing the toothpaste, 
because sometimes like, you know, he needs two hands to squeeze and um, and things that are becoming more upsetting. And for sure, he's like getting a little bit more anxious and upset and shutting down. But I'm at the point where I'm like, do I find some sort of like maintenance at home, whether it be like, should I be incorporating like squeeze balls? And we used a lot of um, silly putty play with Suzanne when we had worked with her. Is it like a good time? Because I feel like, yes, we want to give our children the best skill set possible, but I don't want to challenge him to a point where it's emotionally upsetting and I haven't done any of it, but at this age where they're getting into camps and, you know, further along in grade school and he's not doing some of these things, is it like a healthy time? Um, and I would ask him, but again, he's, he's just such a, like a chill social child that I don't know that he'd have like a passionate point of view one way or another, but is it like a good time to try to introduce some of these at home sort of maintenance therapies that, and then maybe to help him, you know, zip more or open snacks or things that yes, in life you would wish and want to do, but I just don't know if it's like the right time. And again, I know I can play off of his cues, but sometimes he just doesn't have any cause he's so chill. <laughs> I think that makes absolute sense that you just kind of want to naturally integrate some of those things. Maybe you are doing the more squeeze balls like in the morning, or maybe you're doing it before, like he sits down to do his homework as like his sensory prep. You know, you're kind of already mindful of like what skills he needs to do or what skills he needs in order to do some of those tasks that you're talking about, like the zipping, like the opening the containers or anything like that. Or maybe you kind of come at it as like a team approach, like you guys open it together, right? So he does one part and you do the other part. And that just becomes that, like you're meeting him at his level and just kind of flooding him with a few more natural opportunities throughout the day. Um, and then see how that goes. Um, I, think, I think you're right on track. I think the fact that you recognize what he needs in order to accomplish some of those nice seven-year-old independent skills, um, you can definitely do it within a way that doesn't feel like therapy, right? That you guys are just like a team. We're gonna open this container together. I'll hold it, you open it. Um, or now you hold it, I'll open it. Um, and just kind of get some of those repetitions in that way. Okay. Leslie, Jordan here. You know, Hi. Six -year -old. Hi, you know, the irony when, um, we left Mary Rebecca in the fall. We had these like amazing gains, which have been sustained. Like he put on his AFO, took it off, you know, by himself, his day and night one. That and like we, we, you know, and then we like incorporated those like everyday living by manual stuff. We made sure like she really concentrated on those goals, met them. And then, um, and he continues to do it. And there's probably like a couple more in there. And then the irony is that we started having like issues with routines. Like, why does it take so long? Why are you being distracted? And then people are like, oh, maybe it's executive functioning and ADHD. And then I was like, dude, is it because I'm making him do by manual constraint retention during like the hardest thing, which is to get ready in the morning and then get ready for, it's like already boring. It's already like sucks. And then you add, so, but then like, I can't really think about, well, let's make time outside of like the school schedule of like, now let's do OT, like maintenance OT again. So I thought the best thing was to incorporate into ADL stuff. So I don't know if anybody else has opinion or experience on it, but it's like a no man, like it's like stuck between a rock and a hard place. Like which one should you pick? Well, so again, like if it's motivated by a sport, so we, yeah. for my kids play ice hockey. So you have to go early to get dressed. And I just went extra early. So there was even more time to get dressed. And over a period of years, we were able to shrink the yeah. amount of time we had to go early so that now my kid is saying, oh, I actually only need to be there 15 minutes early, not 30 minutes early. So that's to do an activity that, that they, they like. want to do yeah um and you build in the time so that it's not pressured no. i i'm gonna go there are a couple of people from um 
from Europe who are asking about camps in Europe. And the only one that I know of, um, but she might know of, Francesca Fidelli might know of others. So the Francesca Fidelli and Robert, Roberto D'Angelo are founders of Foot Fight the Stroke. And they, they run a bimanual camp in Milan every summer. Um, they even ran it last summer with COVID precautions in place. It's a sports-based bimanual camp. And uh, I don't know if, if it's running and at what scale this coming summer, but we actually went in 2018 from the US. There were two families from the US that went. And uh, I know there's participation from within Italy, but I think they might be open to participation um, from within Europe, but I would contact them. And I know they've also gone to a, either a constraint or a bimanual camp in Spain. Um, so they definitely know about those. Those are the two that I've heard of, but they, they would be on top of it in, in Europe in terms of information. So um, I think we're gonna wrap it up for today. Oh, there's a question about quadriplegic kids. Emmanuel, do you wanna ask your question? We'll answer that and then I'll wrap it up. Tetraplegic. Christina, do you want, or Suzanne, do you want to, or Mary Rebecca, do any of you want to speak to that? Mary Rebecca, you're- Sorry, I was having issues with my mute button. I will say that over the years, you know, when we started CIMT, of course, because it was constrained, obviously that says there's a constraint on the stronger arm and hand. And then over the years, what we're learning is that we can really take the principles that we use with constraint and apply those to children that have different needs. And so we have worked with children who have been involved on all four sides. Um, we've also worked with children who have been involved in lower extremity, even though right now that is, that's not our focus. Um, I do think that the principles of constraint, if a if applied appropriately can really be useful across the board. And I think a lot of that goes to the intensive piece of it, uh, the behavioral piece of it. And I think just to speak to what everyone's been talking about, what I keep thinking to myself is that there's such a need for balance. And I know that we all need that regardless of ability or disability but to find for your children those things that are motivating that they want to do and if you can't do constraint then to try to do that in a bilateral context and to not just do it in in the sense of okay we're sitting down and we're doing this activity but just like Mara and Christina have been talking about to find what they're excited about and to maybe just incorporate that throughout their day that was kind of a longer answer but that's my take on you know, who it can be useful for. Thanks, Mary Rebecca. So I want to honor everybody's time. We're going to keep this one to the to the hour. And as a reminder that May is Stroke Awareness Month, we have our third session for the month next Friday at, a, at noon Eastern time. And the focus is on social pragmatics and behavior. Um, the, the talk's going to be targeting older children and teenagers and the transition toward adulthood, but I think the principles will apply throughout the, the lifespan, and we're really excited to be collaborating with Elise Wolf from the MGH Aspire team. So I hope you'll register and join us next week and um, stay in touch. We'll follow up with a survey as we usually do. And will continue with um, sessions monthly as they're, they're quite well received. So thanks everybody and have a good weekend. Thank you.